Well, what you got for us, Micah, this morning? Uh, coming up on August 17th is Panola College Move-In Day. They are asking for servers and movers. They need at least 50 people there um, at 9.30. All right, that's right, and you know it's a lot of fun. We get us gives us time to interact with these kids and just make a great impression on the new ones. So y'all come on out and help us there. Fifty people—that's nothing for us, y'all. Okay, I tell you what, something coming up October fourth and fifth. I said it last week. I'll say it again this week. It is consuming our staff meetings because we are so excited about it. God is going to change lives. He's going to change families, and that's generational, y'all. Okay, so we're super excited about that. October fourth and fifth at Pine Springs Baptist Camp going to be a great time. You can register on the app. You can register on the website. $100 a family, okay? Registration ends, I believe, 1st of September, September 9th, somewhere in there. So hurry up and get your spot and get lined up for that. What else you got, Micah? On, what is the date? Uh, August 24th, the women's team is having a back-to-school bash. Um, they ask you to bring a dish, and they're going to try to specifically pray over teachers and faculty and students, um, so they're encouraging those who work in the school districts to come out. Uh, that starts at 10 a.m., um, and yeah, so bring a dish. Absolutely. Y'all know how big we are on prayer. We just spent seven days praying, okay? And we're not going to stop now because we know how much of a difference it makes. So, one last thing. If you missed some of this or you're not sure what happened or what time it was or what day it was, check us out on the app, okay? Download the app. Everybody needs the app so that you can stay dialed in. If you were here last week, you know how awesome it was last Sunday morning, and we're expecting God to do the same thing again can't wait. The church, let's stand up as we begin to sing some praises. I praise Him in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters. My enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a I'll praise cause I know you're still in control My praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason
sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sing of praise in the truth packed into this song, a lot of powerful truth packed into that chorus, Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I told this to the first service. I love that because we're talking about how there is nothing we have to bring to the table. No amount of work we could ever do could merit salvation. While salvation is a conscious decision, no amount of work I could ever do could merit salvation. Jesus paid it all. Because of that, all to him I owe. I want us to sing that again. Let's lift it up. Sing sin, the sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's right, that's right. Just wanna speak the name of Jesus. 
Every dark addiction starts to break. Preparing there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Cause your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. First Corinthians chapter 2 says this. It says, when, when I came to you, brothers, this is Paul speaking, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or with wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Y'all, what you got to understand is that Paul was a very intelligent guy. Paul had been trained. Paul had been schooled by Gamaliel. He was a super, super sharp guy. But what Paul knew is that whatever he said, all of that didn't matter if you didn't have Jesus Christ and him crucified in your hearts, okay? And so he said, I'm going to put all of that aside 
And instead of going to my neighbors and trying to tell them how smart I am, instead of going on Facebook and trying to argue every single argument, he said, no, I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to speak Jesus to my family. I'm going to speak Jesus to my neighbors. I'm going to speak Jesus in the streets. I'm going to speak Jesus to anybody that will sit there and listen. Peter would say it over here in Acts chapter 4. He said, for there is no one else by which we must be saved. He said, then the man Jesus Christ, okay? So I challenge you this morning, as you worship, recognize Jesus as the only name, okay? The only name that there is power to change the world, okay? And that's what we're here for, and that's how we're going to worship. Lord, we love you. Lord, we lift you up because there is a name out there, Lord, that has power. No other name, Lord. There are, there are infamous names, fames, names that are famous for the things they did bad. Lord, there are names that are famous for the things that they did good. But, Lord, there is no other name out there that has power than the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we lift that name up. We praise you for who you are. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the Fetter by my wandering heart. 
heart to be and prone to wonder lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart lord take and seal it seal it for thy courts above all else i adore so much. We thank you for allowing us to be able to gather here as, as your sons and daughters. Father, we, uh, we lift high those praises that, that we sing, not only today, but every day of our lives, because you first called us out of our sin and our trespasses. Lord, this this heart that is prone to wonder, you work through daily to sanctify. Lord, so every day I lift up a hallelujah, I lift up a praise to you. We love you so much, Father. Speak through your word this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask that you soften hearts and minds so that whenever your word is spoken, it will land on fertile soil. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. We all said together, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
So glad you guys are here this morning. We got a wonderful crowd this morning, and we uh, we expected you to be here. They told us that the uh, Panola College volleyball team's with us. Is that right? Yeah. Glad you guys are here with us this morning, and uh, hope y'all have a wonderful season, and uh, y'all uh, be sure, and, and uh, we hope you make this your home while, while you're here, all right? So, so glad to see everybody here. They wanted me to let y'all know this morning that uh, the, the parking is a little chaotic, uh, that's, so there is more parking right behind the building here, and you are, it's okay to park in the grass, all right, that's not just for special people, uh, so y'all can drive th- through the back here, and, and uh, there's always more parking in the back, all right, so, uh, and also, we do have an 830 service, and so if you would like to um, have a little more leg room, then uh, the 8.30 is the place to be, okay? So y'all can join us at 8.30 in the morning if, you're, if, if, you're, uh, if you can wake up in time, all right? That's, that's the challenge. Galatians chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. We've been in a series called The Gospel Changes Everything, and we really do believe that, amen? That the gospel does change everything. If you have the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we're looking at in Galatians is Paul, the apostle, he writes this letter to some churches in the area of Galatia that he actually helped start. And he he gave them the true gospel that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are saved. All right? And that's what we sang today, that Jesus paid it all for us. Amen? And so this is the message that Paul brought to the Galatian churches, but there were some people that we would, the scripture calls Judaizers. They were of the Jewish uh, uh, ancestry that followed all the Jewish laws. And they said, no, you've got to follow some laws plus put your faith in Jesus. One of the main things that they said was you've got to be circumcised to, to know that you're going to heaven. And Paul comes in and he says, that is not true. That is not the true gospel. And that you are saved if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it's not about works so that we cannot boast about it. That's all about what Jesus has already done for us. And so this is the whole message of Galatians. And man, he has he is, uh, went through every single corner cleaning up things and making sure they understand and going back into the Old Testament. And we find ourselves today in a section of Scripture where Paul dives deep again into the Old Testament. And he begins to explain God's plan from the very beginning. We looked at uh, Abraham last week, and we're going to look at a little bit more of Abraham this week, and a little bit about Moses and, and how the law came about, and why that's so significant for us today. But Paul, is, what he is doing is he is, he is, he is building a case, that, again, that you are saved through Jesus Christ, and that's it, <laughs> That's it. It doesn't have to do with anything else that you have done or doing or could do that you're saved by Jesus Christ, and that's it. And so uh, this is a little bit one of the lengthier Scripture readings, and it, it, it will be a little confusing as we read through this, especially if you're new with us t- here today and, and jumping in in the middle here. But uh, we're going to read through it, and then I'll, I'll kind of go a little slower through it and unpack it. And, uh, and hopefully by the time you leave here today, uh, you will have a better understanding of the Scriptures. All right? So Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 29. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, and that, of course, means to Christ. Now, in order to understand that, you got to kind of know what we talked about last week where Abraham, uh, he, he believed th- what God said by faith. And God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want to bless you. 
And it's not based on what you've been doing because we, we, we kind of agreed last week that Abraham was probably a pagan. He probably served many gods. And God came to Abraham and said, I, I want to bless you. And through your seed, I'm going to bless all people. And that when he said that through your child or through your seed, it was a foreshadowing that he was going to send Jesus Christ and that through Jesus Christ, all people of the world could be blessed. And so this is what he's talking about here. And so in verse 17, he says, this is what I am trying to say. The agreement that God made with Abraham, it could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. It, it, the, the promise didn't change just because the law came. And so he says, God would be breaking his promise. And so if the inheritance could be received or if heaven could be received by keeping the law, then it would, be, it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously, graciously gave it to Abraham. And so essentially what he's saying is that if, if we could be saved by following the law, then it would cancel out the promise that he was going to send a child that we could put our faith in and be blessed through. <laughs> okay? And so this is, this is a, a him again explaining that it doesn't cancel out this agreement that God had made with Abraham. Verse 19 is where we're going to camp out today. He says, why then was the law given? And, that, and that's the question that I've had. Maybe that's the question you've had. Then what, what's the purpose of all the laws? What's the purpose of having a law if we're not saved by the law? Okay. Well, it was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming child was promised. That's Jesus. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was a mediator between God and the people. That little section right there is huge. And we're going to unpack it today, all right? Verse 20. A mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, he did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict now between God's law and God's promise? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. We, we're all lawbreakers. And so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was made available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So the Judaizers had come in and said, okay, if you want to be, if you want Abraham, the blessing God's going to give to Abraham, then you need to be circumcised to show that your faith is in Abraham. Like, you need to do this. And Paul again is coming in, and he's saying, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't understand so let me explain to you. And so I, I realize today that's a, that's a lot, okay? So we're, we're going we're gonna to unpack this. And uh, it's, it's, this has really been one of, my, one of the most difficult messages for me to study because there's a lot there and, and a lot going on. But I think today uh, th th this has kind of been one of the uh, coolest messages to preach because there's, there's a lot of truth and just good stuff that uh, I think you're going to like today, all right? So let's pray, and let's uh, ask the Lord to speak the loudest. Father, thank you for every single person that's here today. And Lord, as we just take a deep breath, 
slow down. Lord, we want to hear from you. Thank you for your word. And Lord, it's, 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 it's no secret. Um, some things in your word can be a little complicated. But Lord, when we really study it and look at it, Lord, it really is so simple. We're made right with a holy God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Help us understand that today. Have your will and way. Amen. So every now and then, there's some people that like to come over to the house, or we've had people here at the church, and, and they've never ridden before. And so they want to ride a horse, and, and that's, that's cool. We're always, you know, happy to ride, let them ride a horse. And, you know, we always say, hey, if you've never ridden a horse, then we have a horse for you that's never been ridden. Yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, no, we, we put them on a horse, you know, that's, that's pretty safe. And, and, uh, and so we might lead them around there for a little bit and, and then they gain some confidence. And, and so then they, we give them the range, you know, and so they're walking around and usually it's in a round pen or something in a safe environment. And, and we allow them to, to, to walk around and just begin to, you know, continually build some confidence. And if that person continues on and, and wants to gain more experience in riding horses, eventually they get to the trot. And you can't just go from a walk to a lope or a gallop, all right, to a run. You usually go from a walk to a trot to a lope to a run. And so what you got to understand, though, is trotting is one of the most difficult things to learn, and uh, so we've had some, some people that have come to the house before, and they're like, okay, now you're, you're, you're getting the hang of it, so now it's time to trot, you know. And so they'll, they'll kick the horse up, you know, and, and they'll be riding right along, you know, and it's just, I mean, that, that, that butt is just hitting that saddle as hard as it can, you know. And they can't figure out the rhythm is the issue. And so what we'll do is we'll tell them, say, okay, look, you know, make sure the balls of your feet are in the stirrups. You know, make sure you use your legs. You know, use your quad muscles to kind of, you know, keep your seat from hitting so hard. And, you know, be strong in your, in your core. And, and, you know, just you, you got you to gotta get in rhythm with the horse. And so we can explain all of these things that you're supposed to do. But at the end of the day, all of those things that you do are designed to help you get in rhythm with the animal that you're riding. And so one, one of the, th the reason I tell you that, it is, it's very difficult to do. It's not like it takes you a little while. If you've never ridden before, it, it takes you a while to do that. There's, there's a guy in the first service. He's been coming over in the mornings and riding with us. He's been doing it for about two weeks now, and he still ain't got it yet, you know, but, but uh, he's, he's going to get there. But uh, it's, it's very difficult. And, and, and the reason I tell you that is because our, our Christian lives are in a, in a way similar. And that there, when you become a Christian, there are things that you're supposed to do as a Christian. We can, we can list a lot of them this morning, okay? But if people tell you, oh, well, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that, and you got to do this, and you got to do that, okay? But at the end of the day, all of those things that we do are designed to get us in rhythm with the Father, to get us in relationship with him to where when we're going through life, that we are in sync with the God who created us. And I hope you understand that. And what, what Paul is saying to the Galatians here is he is saying, okay, you're more focused on the things that you're supposed to do, that you have to do, and you're missing that God loves you. And he gave his son for you. And we don't live out of rules anymore. We live out of relationship with him. And to be in rhythm with him is to not just have laws, but to have the heart of the law inside of us. And I'll show you that at the end today, okay? And so let's kind of go through this. And in verse 15, he says, he talks about this irrevocable agreement. Now, I want to show you something about uh, Abraham and the irrevocable agreement. If you flip over to Genesis chapter 15, we see that, again, God made this promise to Abraham. Hey, I'm going to bless you. And it, it is not based on what you've done, what you're doing now, or what you're going to do. Uh, if you'll, it, Abraham activated his faith. 
And God said, if you'll go to this land that I'm going to show you, I'm going to bless you. Abraham just believed God. He, he trusted God. He, he put his faith in God, and he went to that land. And then God, again, he came to him. He says, now, to, to prove to you that I'm going to do this, here's what I want you to do. And, and we find this in, in Genesis chapter 15. He says, I want you to take a three-year-old heifer, uh, verse 9, a three-year-old female goat, a three, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And so Abraham, he presented all of these items uh, to, to him, and he killed them. He, then he cut each animal down the middle. He laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. And when some of the vultures swooped down to eat the car carcasses, he chased them away. And then Abraham, as the sun was going down, fell into a deep sleep. And you're like, what in the world is that all about? Okay, well, let me, let me tell you, this was, this was how they would express an irrevocable agreement. And so that many times this, is, this was the official, legally binding sign that your word could be trusted. Okay? A lot of times this would happen in marriages. They would take an animal split it in half, lay it on the ground. They would walk through those two halves together, and they would say, may this happen to us if we break our agreement to one another. It was a sign. This was a familiar way to legally binding, have a legal binding agreement with someone. And so God said, I want to show you that I'm going to do this. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bring a child <laughs> through your seed that's going to bless everybody. But what we find in this story is God says, hey, get, prepare the animals. And we find that Abraham falls asleep. <laughs> he falls asleep, okay? And so watch, watch what it says over in uh, verse 17. It says, after the sun went down, Genesis 15, 17, after the sun went down and darkness fell, Abraham, he saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. Now, you're like, smoking fire pot, flame, what in the world is that? I don't have time to explain all that this morning, but it, it was a rep representation of God himself, okay? So he's seeing God himself go through the two halves, and verse 18 says, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham that day and said I've given you this land to to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates river and he is confirming that this land would be the land of Israel okay some of y'all that are following all the stuff that's going on today and you're wondering why there's up in an uproar okay because God gave that land to Israel, okay? Because we believe in the Bible, okay? And that's, that's why it's theirs. That's why it's such an up people, and people don't want to take it away from them. But this is God's promise to Abraham. And he confirms it through this, this, uh, this ceremony, okay? Now, again, Abraham, he's asleep. So what does that tell us? What God is saying is... <laughs> Abraham, I don't, I don't need you to do anything. You can trust my word. I'm making this agreement with you, and it's based on what I do, not on what you do. Abraham, you don't have a part in this agreement. I'm going to do it no matter what you do in the future. You don't have a part in this agreement. I'm walking through the two halves by myself. Because I'm going to do this, and I'm going to keep my word, and it's not going to be dependent on anything that you do. And it's a picture of salvation. It's a picture that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that God keeps his word. <laughs> and he says, I did this. I saved you. And you can't keep yourself saved. And you're not, you're not going to change salvation if you do something in the future that I didn't see happening. If you don't keep your end of the agreement. No, your job is just to put your trust in me and what I'm doing, or in this case, for us today, what I have done for you, okay? And so this is, this is what 
uh, God does for Abraham. And this is the promise, the irrevocable agreement that Paul is talking about to the Galatians. And we also see in Matthew chapter 1, we see that the lineage of Jesus. And what does it say? Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, that hey, this is the ancestry of Jesus. Abra it started with Abraham. <laughs> Abraham was the... He was the first one, okay? And so we know that Jesus came through Abraham, and so he followed through on his word. But then in verse 17, he says that I'm, uh, this is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made could not be canceled 430 years later. So the law came later on, 430 years later. And so God didn't change his mind and say, well, this ain't working too well. I think I'm going to change the agreement, and now you can be right with God by keeping the law. He didn't change the agreement. So let's, let's look through this, and, and, and let's, let's, uh, let's unpack it a little further, okay? Verse 18, he says, If the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. So it's, it's like this, if you think that you can earn heaven by keeping the law, then just go ahead and tear Genesis 15 out of your Bible. Just get, take your Sharpie marker and, and, and blot those verses out, because <laughs> that's essentially what you're doing. If you think that you can be good enough to be right with God, then you've got to ignore some things that God did in the Old Testament. <laughs> Okay, and so th this is essentially what Paul is saying. And then verse 19, he says, then why was the law given? Why was the law given? You ever wondered that? What's the purpose of the law? <laughs> why? Why all the sacrifices? Why all the stuff? Why, why, why 613 rules? Good gracious. Why? Well, let me help you understand what the law was first, and then I'll share with you why the law was given. First of all, the law, there was three different categories of it. One was the moral law. That's the top ten commandments. Then there was the civil law. The civil, civil law is very similar to the U.S. Constitution. Okay? This is how we live civilly with each other. Then there was the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was all about how your relationship with God was supposed to look. And so in the ceremonial law, there was uh, provisions for sacrifices, for how to build the altar, how to build the tabernacle, uh, how the priests were supposed to act and what they were supposed to do, uh, how many times, you know, you, you, you've sacrificed, how many times you prayed. And all, there was so many things that were uh, related to the ceremonial law and how you were in relationship with God. So there's basically three different categories there. But when, we, when, when God first gives the law to Moses, and, and we're leaving a few things out here because I'm, uh, if you read through Genesis, um, I'm taking for granted that you already know that the Israelite people were in Egypt for about 400 years and in slavery. God delivers them from slavery and he's going to take them back to the promised land where Abraham's life began, okay? where his relationship with God began. But God's going to give, he uses Moses now, and he's going to give them the law, okay? He's going to give them something to, something to live by. Let's look at it in Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 5. <laughs> Y'all hang with me because this is, this is so cool. God's talking to Moses, and he says, Now if, tell the people, if you will obey me, and you will keep my covenant, then you will be my special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give the people of Israel. So essentially he says, Moses, go tell them if they want to enter into an agreement with me, I'll be their God, they'll be my special people, and we'll get along. Okay. Verse 7, so Moses, he returned from the mountain. He called together all the elders of the people. He told them everything the Lord commanded. And all the people responded together. 
we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to God. Now he's, there's, there, he's the mediator, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but when I enter into an agreement with somebody, <laughs> I like to know what I'm agreeing to. Do you? You ever sign something and you didn't know what you were signing? <laughs> and then they come back to you later and there's like, uh, well, you're going to have to do this. You're like, I'm not doing that. Well, you signed your name. <laughs> you said you would do it. Well, I, di I didn't know what I was signing. You understand what you're agreeing to before you agree to it. And what we find here in Scripture is God says, hey, if you'll keep my covenant, if you'll enter into an agreement with me, then you'll be my special people and we'll get along. And, the, and, the, and all the people are like, yeah, we'll do it. Whatever you ask, Lord, we'll do it. There's only one problem. They forgot to ask God what he was going to ask of them. And so what you would say, well, oh, this, is, this is an act of faith on the Israelites' part. They just, they just know how, God, how good God is, and they'll just trust him in anything. No, it actually shows how prideful they are. Because it's like, oh, God, well, whatever you ask us, yes, we can do it. We can do it. We're, we're, a, we're a nation, one nation under God, right? Like, hey, we, we can, whatever you ask, yes, we'll be happy to do it. They saw themselves as capable when literally they were not capable. And again, some of you are here today and you see yourselves as good people, capable of doing good things. The only problem is you don't understand that there's actually, God actually requires of you perfection. And although you may be a good person, you're not a perfect person. And God's agreement is that if you want to enter into a perfect heaven, you must be perfect. And so the Israelites, they're going, oh, yeah, Lord, we'll do whatever, whatever you ask us to. We will obey. And so, and so God's like, okay, Moses goes up. Hey, the people said they're going to do it. Say, okay, well, here's, here's the agreement, all right? So in Exodus chapter 20, he gives them the Ten Commandments. And then he gives them civil commandments. And verse, chapter 21, chapter 22, 23, and then chapter 24, we see in verse 7 that the people say, oh, <clears throat> okay. Still, a little prideful. We'll do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. We'll do this. We'll live by these laws that you've given us. <laughs> okay, and so God's like, okay, that's, that's great. But uh, there's more. I haven't told you how to live in relationship yet with a holy God. And so Moses, he goes back up the mountain. And he's up there, the scripture says, the end of chapter 24, he's up there for about 40 days. And you know what happens in that 40 days that Moses is gone? The Israelites, they go, hmm, I don't know if Moses is coming back. Huh, you know, well, I guess that whole God thing just, you know, I don't know if that's real or not. So we probably need to make our own God for ourselves. And uh, I mean, can you imagine the conversation that's going on in their minds? You know, like the first guy who thought about this, you know, and he goes to Aaron. Aaron's the second in command, and Aaron's kind of a young leader, and, and he's easily influenced. And, you know, maybe some guys got together, and they went over to Aaron. They're like, hey, Aaron, we've been thinking. You know, Moses has been up there. We're not sure he's going to come back or not, and we need something to worship. So all this gold that we've gotten from Egypt, I think it'd be a good idea if we just make a golden calf. And, uh, you know, I mean, I saw that other country over there. They had a calf, you know, and, and uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. And so whatever, we could make a calf out of the gold and we could start worshiping it. And then we would have a God that, you know, like how, how would you like to have that conversation? And dumb Aaron, you know, he's like, well, yeah, 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 well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's a good idea. <laughs> and it hasn't even been 40 days and the Israelite people have already broke commandment one and two. No other God and no false idols. What are y'all doing? <laughs> so Moses is up on the mountain and God sees this going on and he's like, oh, Moses, quick, get back down there. Your people <laughs> have built a 
idol for themselves. I think it's interesting the way God says that. He's like, these ain't my, these ain't, they're not acting like my people right now. These are your people. <laughs> Get back down there, you know. And so he goes down there, and that's when, you know, he takes the Ten Commandments and he breaks them. And, and, uh, and so he kind of settles things down. But, but to understand, the, the Israelite people thought they agreed to doing what God said, and they couldn't do it. And listen, even if you have good intentions and you say, oh, yes, okay, God, I'll, I'll, I'll surrender my life to you. I'll give you everything I got. I, I, I'll give you my life, Christ. But like somebody said last night, you know, or, or yesterday morning at prayer time, like, I mean, the Israelites, it took them 40 days. Like, it takes me 40 seconds, y'all. <laughs> Like in 40 seconds, I'm already having bad thoughts. 40 seconds later, I'm, I'm, I'm saying things. Like even this morning, I had it in my message. Like part of the law is don't take the Lord's name in vain. And this morning, I said, holy cow. And I went, oh, oh, I didn't mean to say that. You know, it's like that's who we are. We're just, we're just sinful people. But the Israelite people, they went, oh, yes, Lord, we'll agree. We'll do whatever you want us to do. How prideful. To think that you could be that good to a holy God. And so uh, we, we, we just see that God, uh, in, this, in this situation, he uses Moses as a mediator, and the people break their agreement very quickly. And so we, let's go back, all right? Let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. Paul says, so then why was the law given? Why was the law given? If, if, if even if God knew that they were going to break it, why did, why, did, why did he give the law, okay? Well, this is what he says in verse 19. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins, to show people that they're lawbreakers, to show people that they're unholy. Okay, so here's number one. I got four things, uh, and th these will go fast. But the, the reason the law was given, because number one, it reveals man's unholiness. It reveals man's sin. You look at the law, and you go, ah, dang it, I said holy cow. Ah, dang it, I, had, I, couldn't, keep, I couldn't keep it, okay? There's a, there was a trend that went around, went around, around <laughs> there was a trend that went around a while back where a parent would take a young child and set them at the kitchen table and tur turn their cell phone video on, put some candy out in front of them, and say, hey, I'm going to go uh, back here for a second. I'll be right back. Don't eat any candy until I come back. You know, and you sit there and you watch the kid, and the question is, are they going to be obedient or not? And it's so funny watching them, and, and it's like to the parent's surprise, they come back and you're like, oh. I mean, you, you ain't one? Like, oh my gosh, you're, you're a disobedient child, you know. It's like, yeah, that's what kids do. <laughs> They're disobedient, okay? And so what, one of the reasons God gave the law to them was to show them, you're not very good at being obedient. <laughs> you need a savior. You need someone who can be obedient, okay? It's, uh, another way to put it is like, it's like a, the set of scales at home where you check your weight, okay? You step on the scales, and what does the scales do? They go, yep, you're fat. <laughs> That's it, you are. You're, it's true, okay? You're fat. And, uh, and, you get, and you get off, you know, and you try to do, do good that day, eating right, and you get back on the next day, it's like, yep, still fat. <laughs> still fat, yep. It just, it tells us the truth, Right? And that's what the law does. The law tells us the truth, okay? Now, a set of scales can't look back at you and say, I tell you what, though, I'll, let me help you fix your fat problem. It will never do that. It only tells us the truth about our issue. You ate too much yesterday. You ate too much last night, okay? That's what it that tells us the truth, but it can't fix our problem. Listen to me. The law was never meant to fix your sin problem. Hear me on this. Hear me on this. Because some of you think that you go and you look, at, you look at what you're supposed to do, 
And you think you can fix yourself by doing the right things. And you can't. You can't. You fix yourself by putting your trust in the one who did all the right things. And that's Jesus. Okay? And so the law, it, it literally, it reveals to us, it revealed to them how sinful they really were. Now, if it reveals to us how sinful we really are, how unholy we are, then number two is the law also reveals how holy God is. How sinless he is. 613 laws. Okay? And 613 things that God said do and God said not to do. Now, there's 32 different categories within the law. And it says, here's how you live in relationship to God. Here's how you live in relationship to one another. Here's, how, here's what you wear. Here's how you treat people. Here's how you have sex. Here's what you eat. Here's, here's you know, how you manage your servants. Here's how you deal with your property. Here's, here's like... If, if an accident happens, here's what you do. Like 613 things in 32 different categories. It covered it all. How? Well, it came from a God who's not only holy, but he's also smart. And he's, he's so smart that he knows how life works. And he knows what happens in life. And he knows because he's the living God, he knows what brings life and he knows what brings death. Because we serve a living God, God knows a little bit about something in our lives. And he knows how to bring life to relationships. He knows how to bring life to marriages. He knows how to bring life to our business, to our property, to our, to our families. He knows a little bit about life because he's the author of life. And why would, we, why would we trust ourselves to our own lives when we could trust our lives to the author of life and the, uh, the author of life who, who knows how to bring dead things to life, y'all? Okay? And so it, all, it reveals that God knows a little something about what he's doing, okay? 613 laws worth of stuff that he says, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed, okay? And so he, he knows a little something about life. And not, not, not to say that, again, don't think that going back to the law is the way to life. It's going back to the author of life that we have life, okay? And so he, it reveals his holiness. Number three is this. It also revealed uh, that God's people were set apart from the other nations. And so... Essentially, what would happen is other nations could look at the people of Israel and they could say, wow, they're, they're different. They worship different. Why do they have to go to the tabernacle? Why do they have to do this? Why do they have to do that? Is that well, their God is holy. Their, their, God, their God is different, okay? It's the one true God, okay? Um, so, for instance, like the Sabbath day. You know, why, why do y'all rest on the Sabbath? Like, I needed some bread today. You're all closed. I need, you know, why are you closed on, on, on Saturday, okay? Well, our God said that we're, you know, the Sabbath day is a day of rest for us. Why is that? Well, he loves us, and he wants us to give us a break. But also, he told us that he can do more in our six days than we can do in our seven days. <laughs> and so that's the God that we serve. It's, it's kind of it's like going... Um, Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday? <laughs> what for? Because <laughs> they're a Christian company. And so the, all of these laws that they would follow were like, okay, they look different. Like, what's, what's so special about their God? Okay? So the law was essentially it revealed God's people as a set-apart people from other nations. Okay? Uh, and then, then we come to the last reason that God gave us the law. We find that in verses 23 and 24 as, as the band comes back up. He says this, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law, kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. And so let me put it another way. He says the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. So Paul says, 
The law was like our guardian, like a personal babysitter in a way. You know what a babysitter does? A babysitter comes and takes care of the kids while the mom and dad are gone. And you know what the kids do when the babysitter is there? They go, mom said I could have as much ice cream as I want. And the babysitter goes, no, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't say that. You can't, ha you can't have that. You can have a little bit of ice cream, but you can't have as much as you want, okay? Mom said we could, you know, drive the go-kart down the street 90 miles an hour as fast as we want. Uh, no, no, they didn't. They didn't say that, okay? Mom said we could do this. Dad said we could do this. Dad said, or, or the baby said, hey, did, did, you, did your mom and dad let you do that? Normally, oh, yeah, they let me do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Knowing good and well, no, no, they don't. <laughs> Okay. No, they don't. The babysitter's job is to reflect the character of the mom and dad into the children. That's their job. Did your mom and dad say that's okay? Is this what you normally do when, when, when dad's home? But when dad comes home, you don't need the babysitter no more, do you? Because you know. <laughs> You just know. You don't ask if you can have three bowls of ice cream because you know. <laughs> you, you, dad's going to say no. You just know because dad's there. And this is what, this is what Paul is saying. It's like, hey, the, the, the law was kind of like a protective custody. Like it kind of told us the things that we needed to do until Christ came. And now we don't need the law because we have Christ is home inside of us. He's home inside of us, Okay. So number four is that it, it reveal, the, the law reveals that faith in Jesus is so much better, y'all. So much better. So much better. Can you, I mean, can you imagine if God required us to be perfect and to follow all the rules? To be right with him and he says I knew you couldn't do it but I had to show you you couldn't do it and I'm just saying there might be some of you here today that are still thinking that you can do it oh I can I can I can make it to church I can I, I can read my Bible as I can I can do it but if you're trusting in those things to make you right with God, you'll be disappointed. And you need to realize today that it is by grace, through faith, that we are given eternal life. So, Scripture leaves us, and it says, it leaves us with this thought. It says, hey, now that we have Christ, we don't need the law anymore. And so, the, the reasoning behind the whole book of Galatians is, hey, God would rather you know that you belong to him than for you to give your life to a set of rules. He would rather be in relationship with you than for you to follow all the rules and think you can be right with him. And so God's desire literally is for us to reflect his character, not put our faith in the rules. So some of you, I'll, I'll make this real practical as I close out. Because some of you, the, the question is, well, what does that, what does that look like? What, what, how, how do I do that? Okay. Well, let me, let me give you a couple of things. Uh, Jesus said all of the law can be summed up in two things. What was it? Love God and love people. If you love God and you love people, you're reflecting my character. And so how, 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 does, how do we know? Okay, well, here's two questions about how we love God. Does blank express love for God? Fill in the blank, whatever it might be. Am I here today because I'm expressing love for God? Am, am I working in my job as an expression of love for God? Am I leading my family as an expression of love for God? How can I, does blank, fill it, fill it in, express love for God? We can put it to you like this. In order to blank, fill, fill it in, 
do I have to ignore God or turn my back on God? If I have to turn my back on God in order to do this, we're out of rhythm. We're out of sync. Loving people, a couple questions. Does blank hurt people or help people? Does it bring life to people or does it bring death to people? Does it help or does it hurt? Okay. And then the second question there is, does blank allow people to see God's character inside of me? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? Sometimes they're like, well, I don't know if God wants me to do this or this or that. No, he just wants you to reflect his character as you do it. That's the more important thing. So does it allow people to see his character inside of me? And if you, if you'll, if you'll <clears throat> essentially, if you'll stop trying so hard with all the rules of religion and you'll just love God and love people, this is the rhythm that we live in as believers. We love God and we love people. This is being in sync with him. And so the title of my message was today, it's, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. We love God. And out of our love for God, we have a love for people because he's inside of us. We reflect his character. And so some of you might be here today and you're like, yeah, maybe I've been trying to put my trust in the things that I'm doing. And, and we want to give you a time at the end of this service today to respond to God. And if you need to put your faith in Jesus and you realize today that there's not anything that you can do to make yourself right with God. I'm going to be over here to the right. Kyle's going to be to my left. John Henry's at the back. Our prayer team's going to be down front. Whatever. You may want to wait till after the service is over. However you want to do it is fine. We're not going to make you join this church. We're not going to bring you up and, and display you before the church, okay? We want you to leave here today knowing that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, okay? So that's how we're going to close today. So if God is dealing with you, you come. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We ask you to continue to move as we close. Lord, give anybody today the courage to put their faith in you. It's all by your grace. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Wednesday evening.